So before we dive into the passage, uh, I want to just tell you guys a little bit about myself. I know I've been at LAFT for two years now, but um, I don't think I've gotten a chance to like meet everyone. And so um, let me just tell you a little bit about my life and uh, what um, initially, when this passage really stuck out to me and um, what I saw in it. So I am a nurse. I work in labor and delivery at a hospital here in Dallas. I actually work um, with Joyce. I saw her earlier. So we work at the same hospital. That's um, really cool. But And I love my job. Um, however, it was kind of a hard road to get this position. I went to school, uh, my first college. I went to UT Dallas, right? Whoosh. <laughs> and uh, my plan was to go to nursing school after that and then go to graduate school to be a midwife. So I went to nursing school, and um, as all of uh, my other classmates were applying for jobs in that last semester, I was applying for graduate schools because I thought that's what I wanted to do. Um, so then, uh, well, I got into a grad school that was awesome. It was one of the top programs in the nation. I was really excited to go. So I'm like making preparations to go uh, to grad school, and then I start to think, I don't know if this is the right path for me. Like, it just maybe it's not the wisest thing for me to spend a bunch of money um, on another degree at this time in my life. And so um, I, after praying about it and talking to a lot of people, I decided that, hey, I think I'm going to stay here in Dallas and get a little bit of experience working first. So I'm going to start applying for jobs. Now, all of my classmates that I graduated with had already applied, and a lot of them graduated with job offers. I was getting a late start, but I, I trusted God. I said, God, you can make up for my late start. Like, you can, um, it'll be okay. So I started applying in June, and I got nothing. July, I still got nothing. Uh, well, I got a few interviews, but um, I didn't get any uh, off job offers at that time. But I was okay. I said, it's okay, God, you can still, you can still work through me. So August... September, I'm still applying. I start to widen my job search, like applying to areas that I'm not even that interested in. Um, I start to apply to other cities, other states, thinking maybe God is trying to like get me out of Dallas somewhere else. And um, I still got nothing. So I went back to my nursing school. I had I talked to like advisors there, had them look at my resume to see if they could help me. And, and they looked at it. They said, oh, it looks great. We don't know why you can't find a job. So I was like, okay, I guess I'll just like keep on doing this. And um, soon it was the spring. I graduated in May, but now it's that next spring of the following year. And I am so tired of applications. I don't know if any of you guys have been in, in a place like this of just feeling so discouraged. Like, why had God not provided work for me yet? I told God, I can't do this anymore. Like, you have to rescue me now. And that's when I really, I, I saw this passage in Matthew 20. And, and in this story, there's a group of workers that hangs out all day um, looking for a job, wanting someone to hire them. And it is not until the 11th hour of the day that they get hired. And so I looked at that and I said, God, I am in the 11th month of looking for a job. Like, isn't that perfect? Like, these guys in our story, 11th hour, and then they got a job. I'm in the 11th month. That would be, like, so cool. God, if you could rescue me right now. <laughs> guys, um, I just have to tell you right now, that is not what this parable is about. This parable is not saying that if we wait for something for 11 times, then God is going to give it to us on the 12th time. That would be cool, but actually, the main idea here is even greater than that. Uh, the main idea that we're going to look at is that God's grace, the gift of grace, or God's gift to us is based on grace and not on our work. So God gives to us out of his grace and not on the things that we do or because we deserve it. Um, so I know we've already read the, the text, but we're going to read it again. And we're actually going to start in Matthew um, Matthew 19:30, and we're going to read to 2016. 
And remember that, uh, so chapter divisions were not originally part of, or not part of the original text. They're really helpful and useful to us, but sometimes we have to look a little bit beyond uh, the chapter divisions. So uh, let's start in uh, verse 30 of chapter 19 in Matthew. I think it might be up on the screen. Perfect, yay. All right, but many who are first will be last, and the last first. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the workers on one denarius, he sent them into the vineyard for the day. When he went out about nine in the morning, he saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He said to them, you also go into my vineyard and I'll give you whatever is right. So off they went. About noon and about three, he went out again and did the same thing. Then about five he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, Why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one hired us, they said to him. You also go into my vineyard, he told them. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard told his foreman, Call the workers and give them their pay, starting with the last and ending with the first. When those who were hired about five came, they each received one denarius. So when the first ones came, they assumed they would get more but they also received a denarius each. When they received it, they began to complain to the landowner. These last men put in one hour, and you made them equal to us who bore the burden of the day's work and the burning heat. He replied to one of them, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Didn't you agree with me on a denarius? Take what's yours and go. I want to give this last man the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with what is mine? Are you jealous because I'm generous? So the last will be first, and the first last. All right. So our passage is sandwiched, or this parable is sandwiched in between this little statement, the last will be first, and the first last. What what does Jesus mean by this? Um, we We see him repeat this other places in the Gospels. And um, this little statement is describing a characteristic of the kingdom of heaven. And our parable is going to try to expound on that characteristic. But um, it's a way of saying that the way of things in the kingdom of heaven is very different from the way we do things here on earth, even to the point of being complete opposites. Uh, So since our parable talks about wages and working, it might be helpful to think of an economy. So in our, uh, our regular economy here on earth, people get what they're due, or like what is owed to them. People get rewarded according to their work, good or bad. But the kingdom of heaven operates according to God's economy. And God's economy is based on grace. So grace means unmerited favor. It's the, what God gives to us, the goodness that he shows to us despite us not deserving it. He gives to us out of his own generosity and not because he owes us anything. And so to expound on that idea, this parable is really helpful to show a little bit more of how that plays out in our life. So let's look at verse 1. We kind of, we're setting up the scene. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early to hire workers for his vineyard. Now this situation might be too... It, might not be very familiar to us, but it would have been familiar to the original listeners of Jesus's time. Um, and actually, it, it would be familiar to maybe people who, um, vineyard workers, vineyard owners today. So just a little bit background about um, vineyards and harvest, which I didn't know before I uh, started studying this passage. But um, Vineyard owners, even today, they don't know the exact time that the grapes are going to be ready for harvest. So it all depends on the weather and the conditions of the the year in that vineyard. You might have a general idea of when the harvest is going to be, but you can't plan ahead to like have a certain amount of workers. Like you don't know on October 12th, I'm going to need 20 people to harvest my grapes. Like you just you don't know that. And so it's kind of like my job in labor and delivery. We don't, we don't really know when all the babies are come. Sometimes all the babies come at one day, and we have to like call in all of our extra people to come and help us. Um, and it's the same in the vineyard, that he doesn't know when the grapes are going to be ready, and then one day, boom, they're ready. And there's a very short window in which to harvest them. And so 
vineyard owners will actually go to marketplaces. In our passage, there's like a marketplace in the middle of the village. I don't know, today it might be like online, maybe, I don't know. But they need to go and find people that are available that day to help them, as much help as they can get for that one day. So that is the situation that we have um, that is kind of the, the background of our passage. And that is what our landowner is going out to do, is to find people to work in his vineyard. So um, the first section of our passage focuses on the hiring of the workers. And there's two groups of workers that we're going to be paying attention to. Uh, the first ones, the ones hired first, these ones are our early birds. So um, verse 2, or verse 1, he goes out and hires them. And, and verse 2 says he agrees with the workers for one denarius. Now, one denarius would have been considered a typical day's wage. The workday was 12 hours of work, and um, a denarius was just like the common, what would be expected for a worker to be paid for those 12 full hours of work in a day. And then um, our landowner goes out and hires some other guys. Um, your Bible might say in the like in the third hour and the sixth hour and the ninth hour, and then, but that corresponds to 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock. We don't really know much about those workers. But then we have this last group that is hired. And um, let's see, it's in verse, verse 6, about 5 o'clock he went out, or the 11th hour. So there's only one hour left in the day, and this landowner is still needing people to come and work in his vineyard. And um, he goes out, and the first thing he asks them, he doesn't say, hey, come work for me initially. He says, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? And uh, what do they say? They say, because no one hired us. Hmm. Can anyone else relate to these guys? I know I can. <laughs> what does it feel like to hang around all day watching other people get hired? It was 5 p.m. Like, why not just go home in the day and come back the next day? I imagine that these guys are feeling discouraged, maybe, like, really rejected. Maybe they're wondering why they even came out that day. Maybe they're beginning to doubt their worth as a worker, saying things like, why would anyone want to hire me in the first place? I'm not as strong and tall as those guys hired first. But the landowner says to them, you also go into my vineyard. And they go. So it's, it's pretty, it's cool. It's encouraging. And after he hires the workers, he pays. So these guys go and work for an hour, and then pretty quickly we have the, the paying of the workers. And so in verse 9, we are told that those hired, for, those hired last receive their wages first. And they get a whole denarius. That was the same amount that the landowner had agreed to pay the first group for an entire day's work. Imagine their surprise and their joy. These guys only worked for one hour, and at most they were only expecting one-twelfth of a denarius, just a fraction of a day's wage. But the landowner gives them the full thing. It's incredible. But what about the first group? You see, those hired first, they see the last group get paid. And they start making like calculations and comparisons in their head. They forget their original agreement with the landowner. Instead, they compare themselves to the other group and they see themselves as superior, maybe more deserving of higher wages because of how long they worked and the conditions under which they work. Verse 10 says they assumed they would get more. And how much does the landowner pay them? One denarius, precisely the amount that they had agreed upon at the beginning of the day. And they're not happy about it. Verse 11 says they began to complain to the landowner. They grumbled about how it wasn't fair. Notice the dramatic language and exaggeration they use in verse 12 to defend themselves. They say, we bore the burden of the day's work and the burning heat, or the scorching heat, I think our version earlier said. And what's their accusation? Equality. He said, you made them equal to us. So how does our landowner respond to this? Verse 13, we get his response to one of them. He says, friend, 
I'm doing you no wrong. Didn't you agree with me on a denarius? So he reminds them of their original agreement. They were upset because they felt like the landowner wasn't fair to them. But what could be more fair or fairer than fulfilling your end of a deal? The landowner goes on to say in verse 14, take what's yours and go. I want to give this last man the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with what is mine? Or are you jealous because I'm generous? So why does the landowner have the right to do as he did? Because it all belongs to him. The vineyard, the harvest, the money he uses to pay his workers, no one else gets to decide how to spend it. But then he brings in a new idea, generosity. So, so far in our story, the workers have been concerned with fairness or justness, and they accuse the landowner of being unjust toward them. But the landowner views it differently. He says, are you jealous because I'm generous? So this wasn't the landowner being unfair, but instead him being generous. Now, I work in labor and delivery, right? And um, some moms come in in labor, and they labor for hours and hours and hours. Like, you know, it's like a day, two days. And then what do they get as the reward for all of that labor? They get a baby. It's wonderful. And then, but then these other moms come in. And they labor like, uh, maybe an hour, maybe two, I don't know. And, and what do those moms get? They also get a baby. Like, it, it, it's, it's wonderful. <laughs> but, but how absurd would it be if the mom who had the longer labor complained about it? I mean, demanded something more than a baby for her labor. So, I, I, like, have you ever heard a mom complain that um, their baby was not worth all the work of the childbirth? Like, it is hard work, by the way. Even with an epidural, it's, like, super hard work. But no, like, you don't complain that the baby is not enough. A new mom is so overjoyed at this incredible gift of life that she's now holding in her arms. And so she might wish the labor had been easier, but she would never say that the reward was not worth it. But that's what the guys in our parable do today. They say, this, this was not enough. We deserve something more. Now Jesus concludes our, our parable with that statement, the last will be first and the first last. How did that play out in our story? At the end, which, of our, which group of workers walked away with the greatest reward? Both received the exact same amount of money. But the group hired first who felt like they deserved more, according to our earthly expectations, walked away grumbling and bitter about what they received. The group hired last, who should have been given very little according to our earthly standards, they walked away thankful and overjoyed at the landowner's generosity toward them. And that is what the kingdom of heaven is like, Jesus says. So what does this parable mean for us? I'm gonna give you guys three points that um, we can take from this parable. And those three points are going to all point us back to that main idea that in God's kingdom, what we receive from him is based on his grace and not on our works. All right, so point number one might be back. There we go. Uh, God calls us to work in his kingdom of grace. So uh, what is, what's the first thing that we see the landowner doing in the parable? He's hiring people. He's putting people to work. So look at the language, like in verse 2, he says, or it says, he sent them into his vineyard, and then later he, he tells the people, go, go, get to work. Go work in my vineyard. Now, you don't have to turn there, but um, we've seen similar language. So, so in Matthew 9.38, Jesus says, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers in his harvest. That sounds familiar. And then right after that, in Matthew 10, Jesus sends out his 12 disciples to heal the sick and raise the dead and cast out demons and preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven has come near. So Jesus puts us to work, and, and this parable is showing a little piece of that. At the very end of Matthew, 
Jesus gives us a final command. He gives it to all his disciples. So if you consider yourself a follower of Christ, then it also applies to you. He says, go and therefore make disciples of all nations. Make disciples. This can be carried out in a variety of ways. It includes ministry to uh, non-Christians in the making of new disciples, like bringing more people into God's kingdom. And it also includes ministry to Christians, teaching people to be more obedient to Christ, helping them to grow in their understanding of God's love and of the gospel. God wants to put us to work. Now, is this easy work that God calls us to do? No. In fact, after Jesus sends out his disciples to work for the kingdom in Matthew 10, he says to them, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Be careful. And then later in the chapter, he talks about taking up your cross, like how we have to take up our cross and follow him. And so Jesus is telling us that this work is still challenging work. We have to be devoted, and we have to be willing to make sacrifices. Now, the disciples knew this, at least partially, and they wondered what they might get as a reward for all this the hard work. You are probably already in Matthew 20, so if you want to look right up at Matthew 19, 27, Peter is talking to Jesus, and he says, Hey, Jesus, we've left everything to follow you, so what is that going to be for us? What are we going to get? And then Jesus replies to him by saying, You will get a reward for, for this work. The work that you are doing is worth it. However... Many who are first will be last, and the last first. And then we have our parable. You see, he ta- Jesus tells this parable to remind us that even though we are called to do hard work, we're working in a kingdom of grace, or in a grace-based economy. Jesus knew the temptation that comes with hard work. We start looking to be rewarded for our actions. And this parable serves as a warning to us against greed and pride, as well as a warning against starting to think that we deserve anything from God. So remember that in the kingdom of heaven, God's gifts are based on grace, on his generosity, and not on our merit. Those of you who are Christian, did you do anything to earn your salvation? No. Ephesians tells us that we are saved by grace through faith, that it is not from ourselves, it is God's gift. In our story, those hired last only worked for one-twelfth of what they received. The rest was a free gift from the landowner. But friend, scripture tells us that we worked for zero-twelfths of what we have received in Jesus. The forgiveness of our sins, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in us, the direct access that we have to the throne of God, the hope in Christ's return, and the promise of eternal life, none of that is given to us based on our works. It is entirely 100% given to us by God through the work of Jesus on the cross. So you can run from God your whole life doing nothing good, and yet the moment you turn to God in faith, trusting in Jesus for the redemption of your sins, you get all of that. There's no waiting period or test to, for you to prove you deserve it. You just get it. It's amazing. Praise God for his generosity toward us, that he gives to us based on his grace. So that is what we can learn from the landowner. Point number two is that God works through those who are last. We're going to look at what we learned through the, this group of workers that was hired last. So earlier at the beginning, I shared a little bit about my story of applying for jobs and getting rejected one after another after another. It was one of the worst years of my life. I felt so discouraged. Maybe you guys have experienced a time like that. Maybe it wasn't a job. Maybe it was an illness or a tough relationship, a financial struggle. Maybe you've been praying for something for a really long, long time, and God just doesn't seem to be listening to you. In times like that, it is so easy to forget God's goodness. You might start to doubt that he cares for you. In your head, you can say, I know Jesus loves me, but in your heart, you're not really sure if you can believe it. But what happened to those guys in our parable, those ones hired last? The landowner didn't give up on them. He came out to the marketplace at 5 o'clock in the evening, and he saw them. 
So those of you feeling discouraged today, God sees you. He cares about you, and he wants to put you to work. Now Jesus says those who are last will be first. This idea of being last can include, it's more than just like being last in a race or being the last one to be hired. It, it refers to kind of a status, like if you're a lower status or um, maybe just, you know, life hasn't been very fair to you and like the situations. Um, and the Bible is full of stories where God chooses to work through those kind of people, the kind of people who are last according to the world. So think back, go back to Genesis, and think back on basically any biblical hero that we have. Which of them did God choose because they were the firstborn in their family? Or because they were the strongest, the smartest, the richest? None of them. In fact, we most often see God choosing the person who is least honored according to our earthly standards to do his most important work. He might then like lift them to a position of power and honor, but they usually don't start out that way. And then think about what Jesus says in the New Testament in his famous Sermon on the Mount. He says, blessed are you who are poor, blessed who are hungry, blessed are you who weep now, blessed are you when people hate you. Because these are the kind of people of which the kingdom of heaven is made. These are the kind of people that God wants in his kingdom. But why? Why does God so often choose to work through the younger person or the weaker person, the person who doesn't seem to have it all together? Well, one reason might be that the bigger and stronger we are, the more we try to take credit for the things that we do. But the smaller and weaker we are, the more God's power can be revealed through us. He gets all the glory in those instances. So what are you waiting for? Get to work. You just became a Christian? Well, great. Welcome. God has a job for you. You've been a Christian for 30 years. It's never too late. Look at those guys in our parable. You didn't go to seminary? Neither did the apostles in the Bible. But they listened to Jesus, and they obeyed him. So what has God called you to do? Remember that command, go and make disciples? Maybe there's a friend that you need to reach out to. Maybe you need to offer to disciple someone here in the church. Perhaps you need to start praying with your spouse or reading the Bible with your children. That command to make disciples of all nations includes the people living in your house. You might say, uh, but I don't know how to share the gospel. Friends, the only prerequisite for sharing the gospel is that you believe in it and you've been changed by it. So if you're a Christian, you are a walking testament to the gospel. Write down your testimony, or write down the reason you're a Christian. That way, you'll have it ready to share whenever the opportunity arises. One more thing about this. So even though God calls us to do these things that we don't always feel prepared for, he still equips us. When the landowner sent those workers into his vineyard, he probably gave them some tools with which they could harvest the grapes. So same with us. God has given us so much to help us. Of course, we have his Holy Spirit. We have his word. We have prayer. But we also have his church. We're not called to work all by ourselves. God wants us to learn from our brothers and sisters in the body. So ask for someone to disciple you. Join a Bible study. Ask for book recommendations. If you don't like to read, um, Loft gives you access to some awesome online resources that you can learn a lot from. So you don't have to go to seminary to do his work, but you do have to engage in God's church. Now some of you might already be doing all these things. This might be your 20th year working in ministry. Maybe you're like me, and uh, you've been in church your whole life. You've been a Christian for a long time. You and I need to pay very close attention to this other group of workers, the group hired first, and the warning of this parable. You see, the final point in this message is that God doesn't owe us anything. We don't deserve anything from God. So where did those hired first go wrong in our story today? Was it in all of their hard work? No, 
That wasn't the problem. Their mistake was in how they compared themselves to the other group and then assumed that they deserved more from the landowner. So to my friends who have spent a lot of your life working for God, how do you view your work for God? What kind of value do you place on it? Have you laid your good works down at Jesus' feet in humility and gratitude and awe that he would even choose to work through you in the first place? Acknowledging that it was only by his grace that you walked in the good works he prepared for you? Or do you hang on to them tightly for your own security and ego? It feels good to be able to pat ourselves on the back. When we make a mistake, instead of facing our own fault, it's easier to look at all of the good things we've done or to look at our neighbor and, and say, at least I'm better than that guy. I know more about the Bible. I've given more money. I've been on more mission trips. And at least I arrive on time to church, unlike her. But guys, prideful comparison is a buffer that cushions us from the pain of dealing with our own sin. And in, in the end, that kind of cushion only leads to our destruction. Because if we're not looking at our sin, we can't see how desperately we need God's grace. In Philippians 3, Paul gives us an impressive list of accomplishments that he could use as his own cushion. He calls it confidence in the flesh, and it includes things like his nationality, his education, his former status as a religious leader. But what does Paul think of all those things as a Christian? He says, everything that was gained to me... I consider to be loss because of Christ. And more than that, I count everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. He says that he considers those things as dung. So all those good things that Paul could use to pad his resume or write an impressive bio, he says they're like, they're like dung. In our parable today, The landowner asked the worker who grumbles, are you jealous because I'm generous? So friend, do you ever find yourself jealous or envious of others in the church? Do you ever find yourself feeling more deserving of honor or feel like you have to defend your goodness or boast about your work for God? Ask yourself, why do I feel this way? Does God owe me anything at all? Am I not just a sinner in desperate need of God's grace? So let's imagine, uh, one more illustration before we close. Imagine one of those old-fashioned balance scales. So we put all of our bad works on one side, and then on the other side we put all of our good works. And we know we've, we know we've done a lot of bad stuff, so that side's pretty heavy. But we, we, put all, we stack all these good works on the other side, thinking that maybe if I could just do the one more right thing, then I could find something that would tip the scale in my favor. So we work really hard to do that. But in the end, we find that mm, it's hopeless. We can never tip the scale in our favor. So you have that picture of the scale in your mind? Now imagine an enormous rock falling from heaven like a huge boulder. It crushes our scale, completely obliterates it. Bad works and good works, they're both gone, smashed under the weight of that rock. That rock is grace. That is the work that Jesus did for us in his death on the cross and in his resurrection from the grave. So there's still work for us to do. We still get to partner with him in building his kingdom, but he, and he rewards us out of his compassionate generosity. But there's no more balance scale on which we stack our good works. Jesus smashed the scale. So um, I want to close, just kind of wrap up my story that I told you guys. I, um, I was looking for a job, and God did not rescue me in the 11th month. He didn't rescue me in the 12th month. He didn't even rescue me. Like it it took several months, and then it took several years to really to get the position that I was setting out for. And I remember struggling, feeling like both groups of workers in her passage today. I uh, felt like the last group, just so discouraged and defeated, saying, "God, like, 
why is this happening to me? Is like, I, I, maybe I'm not even worthy of work or doing anything. But then I also felt the other way. I said, God, I did everything right. Like, I got good grades. I, um, I put all the right stuff on my resume. I prepared for the interviews. And not only that, but God, I've been obeying you. I've been praying. I've been reading my Bible. I've been going to church. Like, I'm doing the right things. So shouldn't you, like, like shouldn't you have to rescue me? Like, I, it seems like you, this is, it, like, it seems like you kind of owe me this, God. That, that's what went through my mind. And you know what God said to me? He said, Morgan, I don't have to do anything for you. God didn't owe me anything. But he had something greater that he wanted me to learn. He wanted me to learn about him. He wanted me to, draw, to be able to draw close to him in times where I felt very desperate. At one point, I sat in the middle of my living room, and I, and I looked at um, all the bills that I had due. I was like, I have a student loan bill that's like useless at this point. But um, then I have, I have rent, I have car payment, and I don't know where I'm going to get the money to pay these things this month or the next month. And God said, Morgan, I'm going to take care of you. And he did. He provided for me in some very unexpected ways and ways that I did not deserve. It wasn't in the ways that I was wanting initially, but he showed me a tremendous amount of grace and provision when I finally just said, God, I can't do it on my own. I, I give this all to you. Um, he also had something for me to do. Um, I volunteered at a pregnancy center, so I wasn't making money, but I was volunteering my time, and I got to share the gospel with every single person that came into that center that year, and and so that was amazing, too. If I got to a point where I felt like, no, I'm not, I can't do anything for God's kingdom. Like, I just feel so discouraged, but God said, Morgan, I want you to be faithful in this work that I have for you. And I'm very, I'm just, I'm so grateful to God, even though I, it was a horrible year, I'm so grateful that he, um, that he brought me through it, and he taught me those things through it. So in closing, let's consider that small statement that we started with. The first will be last, and the last first. We saw how that plays out in people, but what about the one who indeed was first? Jesus was the firstborn of all creation. He was perfect and utterly deserving of all honor. And what happened to him? He became last for our sakes. Philippians says that Jesus, even though he existed in the form of God, emptied himself, becoming a human servant, and that he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Why did he do that? Well, he did it in obedience to his Father for us. That us grumbling, prideful, cowardly sinners might be saved through him. So on the cross, he took the punishment that we deserved so that he might give us that which we don't deserve, his grace. So that we who are last and deserving of last place might be lifted up and given a new position in the kingdom a position in which we are loved and forgiven and sent out to work for him in his kingdom of grace. So as we enter into this time of communion, fix your eyes on Jesus, who became last for your sake. Remember that his gifts to you are not based on the things that you have done, but on his grace. Give him the honor that he deserves. Give him the highest place in your heart, so that in beholding him, you will find both the courage and the humility required to work in his kingdom of grace. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your grace toward us. There is no one who deserves this gift, and yet in your great love for us, you came down, and you suffered, and you died so that we could live with you. Jesus, we ask that your kingdom would come here on this earth, come in our hearts, in our lives, in our community. You have shown us true obedience and humility by your example on earth, and let us learn from you. Give us the courage to follow you even when it is difficult, even when we feel weak and small. God, be our strength. 
And God search our hearts to find any areas in which we are prideful or envious or feel that we deserve anything because of our works. Deliver us from those things, God. Your grace is so amazing. We look to you, Jesus. Amen.